My guest this morning is a young man that I met some years ago whenever I was the principal at the Reverend Dr. Frank Napier Jr. School of Technology. And he worked with me along with some other folks on our PBSIS, which is Positive Behavior Supports in Schools. And we took to each other, had wonderful conversations together. And as it turns out, I found out that he was the author of a book. And as soon as I found that out, I reached out to him to get this date scheduled for us to be on the air together to talk about his book. And as I shared with you in the last hour, kind of trying to whet your appetite as to what we'd be talking about in this hour. His book is about being a single father. And a single black father, single African-American father. And in general, as I was saying, and I'm working my way up to the introduction by saying all this, because like I said, if you, this is definitely an interview that you all don't want to miss. So let some friends know. In general, fathers kind of like are understated or, you know, kind of, you know, an afterthought. That's just in general. We won't even take it to the level of once we start getting into single parenthood. All right. And I am not biased against the women or I'm not. And I'm not. I'm really not because I have big time respect, big props I give out to the women. But most of the time what you hear is, you know, I'm a single mother, single mother, single mother. Even whenever you got married, mother, and it's always the mother. If you ever look at commercials, the dad or the male figure is always the one made to look like the fool. If, if, I mean, and, I, and these are just general observations. Mother's Day, oh my God, we go crazy over Mother's Day. Father's Day is just kind of like, you know, little echo. Father's Day, okay. <laughs> so the fact that this book is written is extremely important because there are fathers out there who are involved in their children's lives. I'm not saying there's fathers or mothers for that matter who are out there who are perfect, but there are fathers out there who are involved in their children. And there are single fathers out there who do the job and they do the job well. And again, I'm not talking perfection. Folks make mistakes. Moms make mistakes. Dad make mistakes. But this is a book, again, that is a testimony to that it can be done. And the author of the book is Bill Davis Jr. And I'm looking at the back of the book where it says, Bill Davis, affectionately called, quote, Brother Black, unquote, is a Newark native who was raised and educated in Plainfield. He is a graduate of Rutgers University with a major in Africana Studies and received his master's in education. Bill has dedicated his life to the work for justice and equality for African Americans and people of color. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Reading Circle Microphones, Bill Davis Jr. Bill, good morning. Good morning, Mark. How are you? I am wonderful. And I always tell my guests I, I get even more wonderful once I see that uh, green light light up on our telephone and I know the guest is connected. <laughs> <laughs> so when I saw the, the light light up at 655, I said, ah, we're on now. <laughs> uh, uh, so as I told the listening eyes, Bill and I, and we haven't talked to each other in a while, actually our, our paths... Uh, went in different directions, at least mine, because I was transferred to another school and I had not been working with Bill in terms of PBSIS. And I was sharing with him before I got on, you know, before we came on air that the school that I have now, everything that he's talking about in terms of Africana studies and uh, people of color and all that. When I tell you that I have an opportunity to do that in the school that I'm in now, because I've always pushed it in my other buildings as well, but I've been able to push the bar the most in this particular building. So, uh, I know exactly what he's talking about in terms of the Africana studies. And so we hadn't talked in a while and we circled back and now the book has brought us back together again. But the book is titled Baba, B-A-B-A, and the Crew. Baba and the Crew, a true story of a single black father's journey to redemption. So, all right. So this is what we're going to do. Bill, we're going to kind of walk the audience into kind of like, where did this come from? Is this your first uh, book or your first work or kind of like, where did the writing start or where, you know, what, what made you decide or when did you decide to become an author? So that's kind of where we're going to walk the, the you know, as well as the contents of the book. Cause like I said, for me as an African-American father, as a black father 
who really, you know, I get, I, I get it in terms of how society and everybody places a big weight on the mother. And as I said, fathers are kind of an afterthought. I don't know if that's intentional or not, but that's why for me, this work is so important. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, kind of like where did everything begin? I mean, did you start out to be a writer? Did you, I mean, what, where did the book come from? So, um, I, and Mark, I appreciate the opportunity to be on the show. And it is certainly a, a topic that needs some more light. And I've been a single father for 28 years. And so I have four children. I became a single dad. They were age three, five, seven, and nine. And, um, and so during the course of, the, of my father journey, different people always ask me, you know, because they would be surprised to see me show up with my children. And the title of the book, Baba is a Swahili word for father. There are other languages besides Swahili that uh, Baba is, is, means father. And my father nicknamed my children the crew. My father was a World War II veteran. And so from his Navy experience, then, you know, he would always call my children the crew. That's how the title of the book manifests. And so, but whenever, you know, over the, over the course of the journey, and you know, where I would show up in my, with my children, and people would always say to me, are you planning to write about this? And, um, you know, so the idea was planted by, you know, we literally had to build a village in order to, you know, move through this process. And um, so um, so then there's yeah, different times I would hear it. And then with my work, you know, teaching and Africana studies, one of the things that most people don't know is that the reason that there's so many single African-American moms is because of the fact that African-American women graduate college at almost twice the rate of African-American men. And so because of that, there are many African-American women that want to get married, particularly to an African-American male. But unfortunately, <clears throat> to use the Christian term, they're not evenly yoked. And so she's better educated, oftentimes may have similar or more income. And so it, so there are many African-American women who are, you know, what are commonly called virtual virgins because of the fact that they don't have suitable mates. And so African-American women are having children at an increased rate but are having, but because there's so so few are getting married, then it just seems like they're more, the percentage of African-American children of single moms um, and has, has sustained itself. And so, but for me, then, um, you know, I was married for nine years, got out of my marriage, and then it, it was better for me to raise the children than my former wife. So I've been on this journey for a long time. And, you know, I knowing what I know about African-American history and the family, those kind of things, and it was clear to me that at some point making a contribution to try to change the narrative around African-American men was something that I thought I really needed to do. And then I'm really, you know, grateful and proud of the fact that, you know, my children, we had some various hurdles to get through, but we've been able to get through all those hurdles. And as of November 14th, 2020, brother, everybody's doing okay. Man, I tell you what, we are grateful and thankful for that. And as you were describing, as you were sharing your experiences, the words, I was listening to the words you were saying. And, and a couple of weeks ago, I had a guest that did this to me whenever I was describing, you know, my time whenever I was in corporate America prior to me changing over to education. And I didn't even realize I had said, and I don't know how I worded it, but she had picked up on some words as if to insinuate that what I, and I probably said the word, but she said, did you hear what you said when you were describing your time in corporate America? You said you were doing time. And I said, I did my time. I don't know how I said it, but I'm saying all that to say when I, I hadn't even thought about it, but whenever you were sharing your experiences, what you said was people were surprised. Oh, yeah. and, and that's, that's my whole premise. That's it. Like folks are surprised whenever they see the father and the kids, they're not surprised when they see the mother and the kids, but they are surprised when they see a brother or a male with their children, particularly a black man, with their kids. And the other thing is, as you were describing in terms of, um, you know, the marriage going where it went and now you winding up with the children, that's not normally the case either because I've gone through a divorce as well. And normally the court side with the female. Mm -hmm. Normally, that's that's where the court. That matter of fact, the whole divorce process is very female oriented. 
<laughs> it, it really is. I mean, I'm, and I'm not telling you, I'm not speaking from what I think. I'm telling you what I know. So it's very, it's very, you know, and that's just the kind of way things are. And then when you put everything you described in terms of educational levels, uh, that is an issue as well. And that's another reason to make sure, you know, everybody gets their education, whether it be college, trade school, tech school, military, start your own business or whatever. That's why it's critical. And I'm constantly telling uh, my boys that I'm working with, you have got to get your education. There's no maybe so about that. Mm-hmm. But again, why, and I'm going to keep emphasizing this throughout the interview of why this is critical, because even in marriages, in many instances, and I've experienced it again for myself, in many instances, women don't think men know how to do anything with kids. I mean, I can remember, you know, early on, whenever my biological girls were born, if my wife at the time, if she had to leave them with me, I mean, you would think I was an invalid. Like, I know how to change a diaper. You know, (laughs) I know how to, I can feed. I know, I know how to put the dresses on. I know the only thing I didn't do was hair. That's the only thing I really didn't do. But anything short of that, I could do and do. I knew how to match colors. It was like, I knew all of that. But, but you would think that, that we don't. And so whenever folks do see now a man and just the children, I guess it does either raise questions, flags, or is he doing that right, or so forth and so on. Did you have that kind of experience in terms of, are they, what, what, like, beyond surprise, did anybody ever verbalize to you their oh, thoughts? Absolutely. absolutely. I mean, the first question was always, what happened? You know, that was always the first question, did she pass away, or... That was always the first question, you know, how is it that you ended up with the children? They were, and so, you know, and the other reason that I wrote this book is because of the fact that for the small number of brothers that are single dads, then, um, so we would go to various events. And so, you know, all the parents, you know, my children participated in all different kind of activities. And so, you know, the parents get together, we talk, blah, 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 blah. And then sooner or later, all the women are over having their ladies' conversation. And so, you know, as a single dad, there weren't hardly any other brothers or men, period, that were single dads. So invariably, I was, so in reading about other subjects and things, you know, to try to understand how unique my experience was relative to other men. And so um, there's a woman out of Marquette that wrote a book that interviewed various single fathers, and they all talked about the fact that, you know, that they were one or very few, and so how... You had to make some adjustments as far as the way that you would interact because of the fact that people would always be surprised and people would always wonder whether it's, you know, something, whether you were doing something right, whether something happened to the mother. And, you know, as opposed to accepting the fact that, <clears throat> as you were, you know, mentioning, I'm competent at doing this. <laughs> so, <you know. laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> I would get offended. <laughs> I'm competent to do it. And, uh, so, you know, so over time, one of the one of the major challenges uh, that you know we face is the fact of not to allow people to distract from what you have to do. Right. And so, you know, so like I'm really clear because I have you know older nieces and nephews, and so I was pretty clear that all right, there's certain kind of things that have to be, you know, put in place in order for you know for my children to accomplish what I think that they're capable of accomplishing. And so, you know, um, somewhere along the way. Um, similar to, and, and this was long before I even started doing PBS, um, but you got to have a routine that makes sense. And so, you know, right. I tried to figure out a routine that makes sense. And so, you know, once I worked out what the routine would be, you know, as far as getting up, getting to school, you know, getting activities. But then you have to do, uh, when I, and I took you all this all the time, one of the first lessons I had to learn was A, how to build a village, and B, to put my ego in my pocket and learn how to ask for help. And so, you know, can this child travel with you to practice or to a game or to whatever the event is? And uh, because I had four children, so back to school, that and things like that happened. I had to go to four different schools. Oh, bro. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Absolutely. <laughs> now, and, see, and then, I, and, then, and then I just show up. You know, the teachers would be looking like, you know, like, where's the vibe? Like, it's, it's just me. So, you know, I would make sure that we on the same page right from the beginning. <laughs> you know, there, there was a whole lot of eyebrows in the communities and schools, a lot of different places, man. There were a whole lot of people who were really surprised at this. And see, again, that goes back to what I was saying earlier. First off, for whatever reason, I have no idea why. 
for first off, the expectation is that as the male, that we, like you said, you know, it's almost incompetency in terms of like, well, mm-hmm. why wouldn't we be able? I mean, it's almost like the reverse of like when you hear females, just like, okay, the same conversation they're having with Kamala Harris. Well, why can't Kamala Harris be vice president? Just right. cause, You know, it's, it's that same kind of phenomenon. Well, why can't a male put their clothes on? Why can't they go to back to school night? Why can't they, you know, and why is it always this shock of whenever the male shows up? So I, 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 I would almost get like offended. Like I'm not stupid. Like I think I can, you know, I, I can, I can maneuver pampers. It's, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, it's like, I, I, I and, and same thing with feeding and, and cooking. And this, but all right, this is the interesting about your story as well. All right. It's one thing you have one, Maybe two. But you're talking being single father of four. Yes, sir. So that I know was pretty much um, is very rare. I won't say it's unheard of, but it's rare. And so, I, I mean, it's like for the females and, I, and females, if you're a single mom, I, I am not meaning it to be offensive. I'm really not. But in many instances, that's almost worn as a badge of honor. I mean, I know I know for a fact over my career in education and dealing with my various schools, that's usually one of the first things that come out in the conversation. Well, I'm a single mom. I mean, so, if, you know, what what are the dynamics with that? I mean, is that I mean, does that work to your advantage or disadvantage at all or, or you know? Um, I, I never really thought about it as far as um, whether it works to my advantage or disadvantage. I mean, so from the I guess from the from the perspective of trying to help people to be um, accepting. And so, you know, and then they're, you know, overcoming their surprise and then, you know, they're questioning about, you know. And so one of the things that I decided very early was to make sure that I was very transparent about it because the thing that I didn't want was people to kind of start suspecting and, you know, chattering and making all these rumors and then that could show up at my house. So, you know, I wanted right. to make sure I was very transparent and very clear that, you know, listen, you know, this is what was necessary, you know, and, and I think that once the people had a chance to, to act with my children, then, um, you know, I think that it helped to allay some of the anxiety that they might have. Right. And so at an early age, all my children were African names, and so I wanted to make sure that they were proud of their names and proud of their culture. And so they would have to introduce themselves, say their name, what it meant, and why they had it. Absolutely. And, and, and so then as people started to, you know, spend more time and get to interact with them, then they were really clear that, you know, and then so their in, our interaction together, then it was like, okay, well, I guess we can, we don't have to have as much anxiety or trepidation about this because of the fact that we can see that they're doing well, that everybody's healthy, everybody's groomed and all the different, you know, things that people observe. And so, um, and then, you know, because, they fortunately did well in school, and you know, as I said, they mentioned. I mean, I mentioned earlier they participated in sports. So, for instance, when uh, when my sons played pop Warner, my daughters were the cheerleaders, and I was the commentator. Right. And so every every Sunday when pop Warner season was happening, we would be at the field all day long playing, participating in different kind of things, and so. Um, and then I really, when I moved to Piscataway. Then, because I was living in Newark, and I moved to Piscataway when I got out of my marriage, and so you know I was starting fresh. So I had to find you know right. people to help with this process, and I think right. that I was just very honest with them. Like, listen, you know, I got four children, I could use some help, and there are people who said, you know, and you have to just dust yourself off and be grateful for the people that said yes. But um, you know, and I think the fact that I was just very honest with them about the fact that listen, you know. If my child can ride with yours to practice or right. to the game or whatever, um, I would appreciate that eventually. And so um, it's been a it's been an amazing journey. Well, see, uh, there again, why uh, I'm going to keep emphasizing the importance of this. And for those of you who have you've just joined me, I hope you've been with me at least since seven. If you didn't get me at six, I get it because I wasn't on at six as I normally am because I was let into the studio late. So if you're just joining me, and again, I hope you've been to some of my guests this morning, is Bill Davis Jr., and we're talking about his book, Baba and the Crew. Now, where I'm getting ready to go again, based on what you just said about all the children being successful, that just didn't happen by happenstance. That happened because of the parents' role in their lives. Now, as a kid... 
it was instilled and indoctrinated by my mother and father that it all starts in the home. As a principal, I still believe that because I know what I've seen over the years. And there is a difference where there is a home where parents or parent is really emphasizing education, excellence, success, so forth and so on, versus one that that's not emphasized as much. And I'm really trying to say that nicely and politically correct. There is a difference. So I'm saying all that to say your children are successful because of your role in it. And the reason that's important, because, again, as a single father, you still did the same thing that either two parents or a single mother or what have you would have done. And yet, society wise, they don't think we can do that. Well, I mean, so because the way that the gender stereotypes have been, you know, unfolded in society, then women are always seen as the nature and caregivers, that kind of thing. And so men are supposed to be the breadwinners and not necessarily, not necessarily emotionally connected. And so those gender stereotypes have been around for generations. And so to some degree, yes, I accept the fact that, um, you know, being single dad, that, you know, it, people had to make some adjustments in how they see those stereotypes in order to adjust to the reality that I was living. And I agree to some point with the fact that, yes, um, I was very clear that, you know, uh, the goals that I intended for them and then, you know, put the support mechanisms in place to help them to reach it. So I think that there are other parents who probably desire those same things, but may necessarily put, be able to set up the supports. And so during my career at Rutgers, um, I had the privilege of working in a pre-college program at Rutgers North. And we worked with students from 6th to 12th grade. And so, I, in fact, I did the group counseling sessions. And so when I, we'd have conversations with youngsters about the different kind of things that they were facing, and so what, what was really instructive for me is when I moved to Piscataway, they didn't have anything like that, so I was able to create one. And so when my children were struggling in school, then I would find a tutor. I would get whatever support that I needed in order to be able to help them to accomplish what it was that I intended for them to do. And so I think that sometimes parents, the hardest thing for some parents to accept is the fact that their child needs help, but they may not either be willing to acknowledge that the child needs help or may not be able to know how to get the help in order for the child to be able to excel. And so, and then I wanted my, I didn't want my children to live in isolation. So on Saturday mornings, we would get up, for the, if you weren't on the honor roll, so the expectation is always going to honor roll. And then we were bored, so we were on the honor roll, right? So you got money, and we got to go get special meals. We did different things to reinforce, you know, you being on the honor roll. But if you weren't, then, you know, when I was doing the Saturday program, then you got to go. Let's go, you know, um, because you're not exempt from this. And so if you need help, and sometimes getting helping the children, because even when children need help, their ego gets in the way. And so they may not necessarily want to have their friends and different people know that they're not doing as well as right. they might want to do. And so and then sadly, from a cultural perspective, there are children of African ancestry who to be smart is, quote, unquote, to be acting white. I mean, so that's a, that's a negative thing that we need to really address, that if you are smart in school, Instead of honoring our ancestors who were really intelligent and, and geniuses, then somehow we're mimicking somebody that, that's not from our from our group. Absolutely. And so you know, I had to emphasize to my children and to the students that came, like, look, you know, genius comes in all colors, and so we need to embrace the fact that if you are a genius and if you need help in order to that, and don't be afraid to let your light shine, then by all means, you know, let's make sure that you can, you know, excel in the manner that you need to. Because I would tell them that any, that, you know, in this society today, if you're working from the shoulders down, you get minimum wage. And we're Absolutely. We're in the age of intelligence, and so we need to make sure that you have the ability to articulate and enunciate your ideas and to be able to communicate well, because that's ultimately what's going to be able to happen for you to be able to get to the workplace. And so, um, and I, I modeled the program in some way after the standard delivery. So every Saturday, we just have to introduce themselves, they have to say why they're there, something they hope to accomplish. And then one of the math tutors, a really good friend of mine, who most of his school career was in special ed, would do a poem. And so then it really kind of blew them out that this is an accomplished poet who's also a math tutor. And so it broke down the stereotype about, you know, and he would use the hip-hop beats and he would do his poems. And so, you know, now the youngsters are hear the hip-hop poem, 
and a brother who's a mass shooter with locks. It's like, wait right. <laughs> Absolutely. And see, <laughs> I'm listening to you again as, as, as we as you're having and you're sharing because I, I hang on every word intently. And, and what I'm gathering from what I'm hearing from you in terms of the building of your children's self-esteem. Now, the, earlier on, you said each one was named a Swahili name. Now, my, let me see. My oldest biological daughter was, was named after my love for music. Her name, her first name was Aria. My youngest biological daughter, her name was named after my love for our people. Her name is Swahili as well as Niara. And Niara means of high purpose. And she's known that mm-hmm. since she was like in the womb and she really has lived up to that name in terms of of high purpose and so i'm hearing you now say your children had the african name they knew what they meant they did what they needed to do with them and now you provide it because in terms of the denial that you were talking about oh yes i see that on a daily basis <laughs> i see denial mm-hmm. from parents on a daily in terms of the help their children could use mm-hmm. So did the kids, like with all that you had going on, and I think I know the, this is a rhetorical probably, but did they feel any type of way or, or was their self-esteem, uh, did it take a hit because now they were only with their father, not with their mother or not with both this, that, and the other? Oh, sure. or, so talk a little bit about that because, again, having been divorced, I know what my kids went through, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, so sure, I mean, and, uh, ironically, so my oldest son is named Sekou. So I had the privilege of meeting Sekou Ture, the former president of Guinea, when he came. So that's how he got his name. Right. <clears throat> my former wife's father was from Haiti. <clears throat> Excuse me. So my second son was named in honor of Tucson Overture. My daughter, Imani, um, when we get to three children, it's like, you know, you need some faith. Faith. You know, that's right. Faith. Imani is faith. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> and my youngest daughter, Naima, um, her middle name is Ife, which means love. Um but when we moved here, um, my daughter, Rimani, when we were looking at some place to live, asked me, where's mommy's room going to be? Because for, before I moved here, my former wife and I lived in separate rooms. Right. And, um, and so Imani, mommy's room going to be? And, you know, not recognizing the fact that their mother wasn't going to be living with us. And so, you know, it'd be different times when, you know, they would cry and, you know, have their emotional challenges of, you know, uh, not being with their mom. And then when holidays would come, and then if she didn't come to see them and all that kind of stuff, you know, it really, um, you could see the pain that they were experiencing. And so, which is one of the reasons that, you know, building the village became so important to me because I needed them to be surrounded by other people who would also care for them and to help them to cope with the fact that, you know, there would be times when, the message that I'm that they 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 know what I'm going to say, and so sometimes I need someone else to say it a little more in a different way, maybe more softly, maybe more lovely or elegantly or whatever way they could communicate it. And then when they needed some somebody else to be able to give them that support, and so um, of course there were a couple of folks you know who stepped up and um, you know gave the support that they needed, but yeah, there were different times when um, you could really you know, it was real obvious that, you know, they're, they're missing their mom and adjusting to this reality. Now, fortunately, I was in the room when all of them were born. And so from right. the from birth, um, you know, my presence was very significant. And so I think that they were confident in my ability to be able to create a space and environment for us to live in. But I also think that they needed and desired to have their mother, since their mother had also been with them from, you know, the time that they were born. Right. Um, you know, we um, worked through. And so the last the book, in fact, are their perceptions and that, that, you know, about how they adjusted to the mom that being there, you know, to uh, to their African names, all those kind of things. They all answer those questions. And so, uh, you know, in fact, different people said to me, that's pretty great that you better let them out of the book for them to answer those questions. I said, well, um, when I decided to write the book, their voices, to me, the book would not be complete without their voices being right. in it. I mean, so my youngest daughter is 31. And um, so, you know, she was 30 last year when I was, or, yeah, when I started writing the book a couple of years ago. So she was in her late 20s when I started writing the book. And so then I had a really good editor, 
And so then we kind of discuss how to get the children's voices included in the book. And um, so, you know, it was um, it was necessary to, you know, for people to get opportunity to hear from them about, you know, because they perceive as being very strict. I perceive as being very structured. <laughs> 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 That's absolutely right. <laughs> but <laughs> but going back now, this gets back to what you were saying about routine. And as I was sharing with you in terms of the, the environment, the school environment that I'm in now, when I tell you like our routines, that's that's one of the reasons why. And, and we've reestablished some routines virtually, but it's nowhere close to the routines we had when we were in the building. When I tell you in terms of working with the boys, like that was exactly what we did in terms of the school was the structure and the routine. And the boys took to it. Now, they, of course, they're not just like you just said, they're not going to admit that. They're not going to admit right. to us that, you know what, Mr. Medley, we really like this structure. We really like this routine. But, mm-hmm. you know, they think it's strict now. But as they're older, I'm sure if they look back on it, they can begin to see the, the method of the madness. Right. Right, right. Because now as a kid, yeah, as a child, yeah, it seems like. But now when you get older and you look back and you think about it, it's kind of like, okay, I see, I see the method of the madness. Now, in terms of, I heard you talking about, uh, in, in your describing of this whole notion of being smart and, 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 and tagging that to, well, you're smart because of who your ancestors were and ancestors are compared with, because that's why I hate, and we may have had this conversation before, I'm not sure. That's why I hate this whenever other black folks tell black folks you talk white. That mm-hmm. is like, that, that, that just gets the hairs up on the back of the neck. It really does. Because mm-hmm. I always tell folks, like, first off, what are you saying about your own folks? And secondly... Right. Anything, everything that white folks do is not correct. That's right. So, right. you know, you can't ascribe. I mean, doing things in its proper manner is not tagged to a race. Mm-hmm. You, you either do it proper or you don't. You do it in its excellent form or you don't. It doesn't necessarily mean if you're doing it in an excellent form that you're doing it like a white person. That's yeah. right. So that whole right. notion of, and interesting enough, when you said it, when I recorded the little infomercial commercial for today's show, I was sitting in the section of my house that's dedicated to the ancestors. I have, like mm-hmm. in my man cave, I have a whole little section that's dedicated to our ancestry. And that's where I shot mm-hmm. that little video. Uh, yesterday promoting this morning's show but that is critical too to help the kids understand their ancestry and i notice here even on the book the colors i mean everything is by design on Mm -hmm. this book cover folks the letters the b is in yellow the a is in red the b is in green and the a is in gold Mm -hmm. and the crew Mm -hmm. and then you were saying baba was swahili for father father okay and by the way, I heard you said that your dad was in order to thank him for his service, whether alive or or passed on. Either way, thank him for it. We just had Veterans Day. Mm-hmm. And so thanks for the service. But again, it is so critical and important because, like I said, everything, like you just said, <laughs> structure. <laughs> they thought it was strict, but it's structure. But all of that is what formed them and why it was successful. Years ago, I used to travel the country doing a diversity training. And one of the exercises that we did throughout the, it was a two-day course. We had a large post-it notes, the huge ones that you can hang on the wall. And we would hang them all around the ballroom. And we would have different categories. And we would tell the participants, all right, now look, we're going to give you this marker and you're going to walk around like a galley walk. You're going to walk around and under each category, you're going to put the stereotypes of what you've heard about each group. Now, you don't have to believe them. We were very clear on that. You don't have to believe it, but if you've heard it on TV, radio, conversation, or whatever, put that down. Needless to say, one of the categories was black men. And Mm -hmm. under black men, I could have taken the same yellow poster from me around the country, because the same, and, and the other groups as well, for that matter, the same stereotypes would come up. Lazy, can jump, a lot of kids, run women, Yeah, yeah. that's what that's how we were perceived in terms of stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So in many Mm -hmm. cases, in terms of now being a single black father, many people think, well, you know, he ain't going to do that because he ain't going to be paying attention to those kids. He's going to be worrying about running women. He's going to be worrying about hanging out in the streets. He's going to be worrying about anything but them kids. Did I mean, Mm -hmm. did what was that? Did you come across that at all? Or, or, you know, like I said, because in my mind, it's not going against the tide. But in many people's mind, it is. I mean, what's, what's amazing, Mark, 
and um, is that there'll be people who will love you, so and still not recognize your truth. Right. And so there were people in my family who um, didn't think that I was going to be successful at this. And so, um, you know, it, it took my mom years before she finally told me that she realized that I made the correct decision. And so, yes, I ran into, you know, all different kinds of um, insinuations about, you know, somebody said to me that I was doing it because I was going to get money. Somebody said I was doing it because of the fact that I wanted to find more women. You know, and in fact, one of the things my mother told me, she said, that I'm going to meet women who would be interested in me. But when they find out that I have four kids, that that interest will quickly change. That was absolutely true. Um, because people often ask me, how come I never got remarried? And I said, well, you know, I was open to that, particularly at the beginning. Because of the fact, you know, I was open to meeting someone and they had children, you know, we'd kind of connect together and, you know, raise, raise our crew together. Right. Um, but the reality of it is that if you're really parenting in the manner that you, that one would hope, then, um, you don't have a lot of time, you know, so you, you know, go to bed at night, get up in the morning, get everybody dressed. Everybody right. Goes where they're supposed to go. You come home. So part of that routine was when they would eat breakfast, I would start working on dinner. And when they came home from school, then we would go to their different events. Uh, we'd get dinner, then go to their various events, and then, you know, put some homework in. They could only watch television two hours a day. And so, you know, I wanted to you know, have that structure in place about how we, you know, would do the things we'd have to do. And so then, you know, and when you're dating, the things that make dating work, it's time and money. And those are two things as a single dad I didn't have. I had, <laughs> right. I had very little time and hardly no money. <laughs> but, right. So, so, so you know, dating was not something. So anybody who was kind of, and then, you know, um, the and people want attention, you know, and so uh, I couldn't afford to get distracted from raising my children because I know that at the end of the day, which is why um, the whole question of legacy. So my, my website is bobboslegacy.com. Because our children are our legacy. And so right. whatever else we do in the world, the people are going to know partly about who we are by way of our children. And so when you think about somebody like Mandela or Malcolm or King, they chose to embrace the world as opposed to just do what they could do with their children. I mean, and I don't know if you've seen the video with, with, with Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was away from his children so much when he got home. He, gave, he had four children, ironically, as did Malcolm. Um, each child had a special place on his, a special place on his face to give him a kiss when he got home. And that was his way of having a special bond with each one of his children. And so, but, you know, um, sadly, all of them, you know, they in fact, Mandela's nickname was the father of the nation because he right. spent between the time that he spent in prison and the time that he spent doing the work trying to get South Africa's independence. And so, you know, we have to make decisions about how we, move through the world, and, you know, since I wasn't operating at the scale of Malcolm or Martin or Mandela, my goal is to make sure that my children are doing well so that then, uh, at whatever point in the future, because these issues that we face of social justice have been around for generations, and I knew that at the end of me, or not at the end, but when my children became of age, those issues would still be present. And so I would have an opportunity to participate, in fact, when they were younger, we used to, I used to take them to demonstrations all the time. And so they grew up understanding the issue of social justice. And Absolutely. Feel like in some way that we were exempt, that, you know, because when they start driving, like I said, this conversation with your daughter, and listen, when the cops, not if, but when the cops pull you over, right. this is what's needed so that you can get home safely. And if there's some crazy stuff that happens, we can handle it when you get home. But I need you to get home safely. And so, you know, I didn't want them to be confused about any of those issues. And so yeah, it was, um, there were, you know, a range of different kind of issues and topics and concerns that, you know, um, we had to address. But as I say, bro, I'm just profoundly grateful and appreciate the blessings of everybody being healthy and well, educated, employed. Like, man, you know, it's uh, <laughs> particularly in this environment. In fact, in the epilogue of the book, that's with how I started. My sister was in the hospital for 81 days with COVID. Wow. And when my nephew took her to the hospital, he was in tears talking to me about watching his mom be put on the ventilator. And then right after that, 
is when I went to a protest in Newark. And so it was right after the George Floyd killing. And there were 10,000 people out, man, upset about the George Floyd murder. Right. And so, um, you know, sometimes we have to be in the presence of others. Right. In order to make sure that, you know, that the rage that we feel, we want to be in the presence of others who understand that. And so despite the pandemic and the health risks, unfortunately, you know, people were wearing masks and all that kind of stuff. But it was time to go to this protest. In fact, Mayor Barackley was there. Larry Ham and people who say from Progress with who called the protest man, but there were ten thousand people that came out there in order to, you know, participate in it. So I just think that, you know, I'm grateful for the fact that there that there are desire for social change is still really present. And, you know, unfortunately, man, you know, enough folks came out that saw that, you know, we needed a change to get this fool out of the White House. Absolutely. So, um, you know, he might not want to go, but damn it, January the 20th. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Whichever way you go, it don't matter, but you're coming out of there. That's absolutely right. So, you know, but, uh, but yeah, so, but that's, that's how I start the epilogue and then raise the issue of the fact that, you know, um, the, the issues that we face, and I also say in the book, I was racially profiled when I was in elementary school. The issues of racism are still present in the country. And so, you know, our children need to be, need to understand it and not internalize it as individuals. It is something that is per- perpetrated against us as a group, not as individuals. We experience it as individuals, but it's perpetrated against us as a group. And when we understand it and we don't internalize it, and I think that's what happens to a lot of children, is that they experience some form of discrimination and then internalize it individually. Correct. Their parents are equipped to help them to move through it and not to internalize it. I mean, fortunately, man, when we were growing up, the music had a much more social, relevant, Correct. And positive information in it. And a lot of the music today, sadly, doesn't have that in there. So we have to find ways in order to find some positive and productive kind of things for our children to watch and listen to that's going to help their self-esteem to be better. Absolutely. And interestingly enough, what you were talking about in terms of, you know, because of whatever cause or work or what have you, I was on a call Thursday night with my classmates. And I don't know, they said some of them said they were going to listen this morning. Some of them may be. But one of the young men, one of my classmates was saying how he had this great job. But it caused him to travel all the time. It caused he was he was overseas. He was traveling like, you know, 100 sometimes per year, you know, 100 nights out of the house or in a hotel. And and he said it dawned on him. He came home one day and didn't realize his son had grown to the height he had grown to. And he really it really hit him in terms of the time spent away from the kids. And this ultimately wound up, you know, getting out of that position, but mainly because of exactly what you just said. The other piece on that is interesting. You were talking about with um, with King and, and, and Malcolm and all of them. Absolutely right. In terms of leaving legacies, they left theirs in a way, but they didn't get a lot of time with their kids. And the other piece of that is not only are your kids going to leave a legacy. And I tell my authors this all the time whenever they're on the show in terms of once you've written a book. You now have a legacy because this book could wind up 50 years, like after we're dead and gone, this book could Mm -hmm. wind up in somebody's attic or basement or in some type of a trunk or something that folks can still reference it, pull it out, read it. They want, I mean, it might be somebody's grandkids that didn't know their grandfather had the book that was rummaging through the attic and came across Mm -hmm. it. So Mm -hmm. the fact that you have something now pinned to paper is a legacy in and of itself. Absolutely. And I hope they're going to find a library, bro. I mean, that's, that's my desire. That they're going right. to go to the library and want to learn about the black family. And then, you know, this, well, there's a book by, you know, an African-American father who talks about his journey as a single dad. Um, so that, that's, my, that's my desire and intention. I mean, so I'm also hoping that it's going to be in um, bookstores. Right. You know, for, and so when, when Barack wrote his book, and in fact, so, you know, the, the book sales are, are slow. But, you know, I I know between the election and the pandemic and all that kind of stuff, I anticipated that by the spring of next, late spring, when we get closer to the fathers, I'm hoping that there'll be a little more, the the interest might, you know, perk up a little bit. But when Barack wrote his book, um, Dreams of My Father, then it wasn't until he started, when he got into the Senate and started running for president, that the book started to get some more light. And so there'll be different times and circumstances when books start to get more light. And so I'm hoping that you know, I want to work with men, with 
men, I mean, the groups that are working with young men, particularly around the issue of mentoring, because one of the things that I want to say to these young brothers is that, listen, you know, um, the children will be a legacy, and even if your father was not as involved in your life as you may have desired, it's up to you to decide how you want to be, <clears throat> what role you want to play in the life of your own children. Oh, absolutely. And so I, I ran track in high school. The one and only time that either of my parents came to see me was when we ran into Penn Relays. My mother came to see me. And um, so part of the lessons that we learned from our parents will help to shape how we decide to parent. Oh, absolutely. And so I wanted my parents to participate more. But I, so that lesson was how would I apply to my own children. So when they played sports, they were in the band, whatever they were in, bro, I was present. Oh, and absolutely. So I, want them, I want them to know that if you're willing to spend the time, and we had a rule, if you sign up for something, you can't quit. Right. So if you're on a team, then, you know, you're going to be on the team. If you don't like it, you got to stay on the team until the end of the season. And then the other thing is that if they want to honor roll, then I would tell the coach, coach, they can practice, but they can't play. Right. And so then the coach is now like, all right, listen, you know, we need you to play. It's your grades, you know, because <laughs> sometimes I think parents don't realize the way that they can utilize, you know, different resources within the community to help them accomplish the goals that they want. Um, and so, you know, and a couple of times that happens, you know, if they be on the team, like, all right, listen, you know, and I, and I'm there, so I know whether or not you're going to try to put them in the game. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely right. <laughs> and see, even that call is, and I'm not saying a lot of parents won't do that, but most will because they're more focused on the athletic. Like, okay, you know, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't care what I, but, but my, one day my son's going to the NBA or my son's going to the NFL. So, you know, him playing in that game is more important than his studies. And I have that conversation often too. Like, <laughs> and I have made that call because as the principal of the school, usually if you have a school basketball team, you can override the coach. Right. I have been in situations where uh, the star player and we were in the playoff game when I told the coach, nope, he's not playing because of his grades or because of some infraction. He's not playing. And the kid and the coach had a fit. Nope, not playing. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> so to hear a parent say that, to hear a parent say that, I know it throws the coach off. Like, And, and I laugh when you say, well, I'm there. So I'll know if you right. tried it or not. Right. Absolutely. Right. right. I mean, and so Mark, but one, of, one of the reasons that I think so many parents get distracted because and I, I do this in my class. I would ask the students in my class, can you name an athlete in any sport? Can you name right. five athletes in any sport? Yes. Can you name an artist, five artists in any genre? You know, singing, acting, whatever. Can you name five scholars? And so people can do the artists, they can do the athletes. When you ask them to name five scholars, and so the society, you know, generates this whole thing that artists and athletes. And so and I, and I, I'm a huge LeBron James fan, bro. Right. I mean, right. as an athlete and as an activist. And so you and I don't have that platform. And so because society doesn't give educators the platform, there is no Super Bowl for educators. Correct. And, you know, so we, we're, so families and communities undervalue, you know, what we do in education. Correct. Because of the fact Correct. that society doesn't put much emphasis on it. And so even though it's fundamental to what people need in terms of being able to accomplish the goals that they set in their lives, but the possibility of being able to make these millions of dollars in any of those areas, then, yeah, you know, so people see us. We're just regular, you know, we have a regular car, regular house. We don't have no bling. We ain't, you know, we ain't right. television. Right. You know, we're not doing all that stuff. And so as a consequence, and, you know, um, and so but for my own children, like, look, let's be clear. How many <laughs> athletes right. and or artists are been injured, Sucking out of their money. I mean, you know, how many end up broke? I mean, like 70%, 60% of the guys playing the NFL either become addicted to something, go bankrupt, right. marriage right. fail. I mean, you know, so the, the price, the high price of success in these things is just absolutely ridiculous. And so that's, and if, if you get injured, then yeah, then you're going to have to have something to come back to. You can only do whatever it is for a certain period of time. And so, you being educated is going to be fundamental to what happens in the rest of your life. And so we're going to get that down first. And you can do whatever the hell else you want to do once you get <laughs> Right. <there>. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, and, and see, <laughs> what, what I'm hearing throughout the hour that we've been talking, not, well, not an hour yet, but close, but for the time we've been talking, is like I'm hearing constant communication between you 
and the children. I'm hearing constant teaching. I'm hearing constant discussions. I'm hearing, I mean, and again, a lot of times with the breakdown is because and even two parent homes, a lot of times that kind of communication is not happening. Like you just said, let me be clear. And, and see, a lot of time I'm, I'm not hearing that. And, and for those of you who order the book, and I hope all of you do, if you look on the back cover, all four of them and are these, and this is all college graduations, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. All, there's a photo of all four of the children in their college graduation uh, attire and their regalia. They have on there, their stoves, their robes, their caps, their gowns, all of them coming out of college. On the front of the book is a picture of Bill and the kids when they were younger. On the back of the book is each one of them graduating college. So these yep. things that he's talking, and that was intentional too, because I mean, I, having done this for now 20 years with authors, I know everything on covers and everything is intentional. At least it ought to be. But I know I can look at this one and see everything on here was by design. Oh, yes, sir. Brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, because we said um, uh, pictures worth a thousand words. <laughs> right. And so... So when you look at the cover, then, yeah, you know, I wanted to just speak volumes right from the beginning. And so, um, and ironically, the day that we took the picture on the cover, they didn't want to go, we, you know, somebody had did something. And so, you know, there was a little tension. Right. And, um, you know, so when we get there, <clears throat> and instead of having on, you know, people usually get all dressed when, you know, put on some, you know, more attractive attire. So we get there just in regular attire. And right. uh, well, why, why are we taking pictures like this? Listen, every now and then we just got to do do it as we are. And so when we're trying to figure out, there was another picture of, of all of them when they were really young. We were trying to Photoshop it to get me in it, but it didn't work. So this picture actually became the one that's like, this this captures what we did on the, on a daily basis. And then on the back, it's like, listen. And that's why when people would ask me, you know, before, and why I picked the um, the redemption Bob Marley's redemption song is something that, you know, when, so when we were traveling, we took a lot of road trips, and I couldn't afford to fly to Disney World, so I drove to Disney World several right. times. Um, we take road trips to different places, and so, you know, listening to music, so Bob Marley was one of the, you know, in the redemption song, at a certain point in our lives, we can see that the lessons that we taught and the fact that they've been understood, and now people, I mean, your children or your family or whoever's actually embraced it, that's the redemptive part of it. Absolutely. And you must have read my mind because that was my next question in terms of the the byline or the, the or the subheading, a true story of a single black father's journey to redemption. So you just explained mm-hmm. that was the exact question I was getting ready to ask. And yep. so absolutely. And, and I'm very familiar with Bob Marley's redemption song. <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. very familiar mm-hmm. with that as well. So, uh, again, a listening audience, if you haven't gotten anything, out, and maybe I'll ask Bill that question is at the end of the day, when someone reads this book, what you know, what is it you want them to get take away from it? And, and my hope is that you've taken away is the communication piece I was just talking about. The whole notion of men can do it if they choose to do it. It's, it's not one of these uh, things where just because he's a male that he can't do it. I mean, the genitalia or the gender does not determine whether or not you can raise children or not, even though many people think that it does. As a matter of fact, that's, that's the other question I had for you too, especially since your background is in Africana studies. I know that's the, but what we've been talking about this morning is the perception here in the United States. Is that same perception in terms of males raising children? Is it the same in Africa or in yeah, our ancestry? In fact, in, in, in fact Mark, um, one of the things that I want to do is to um, to do a Fulbright. I haven't applied yet, but I want to do a Fulbright because I want to really explore that issue. What are the images of fathers? I'm, I'm going to probably do the Caribbean as opposed to Africa, only because it's closer. Right. Um, but I'd be curious what the perception of fathers is in the Caribbean and or Africa. Right. And so I know that in, in certain African um, countries, the the whole issue of of being a baba because it's it's a revered position to be a baba to be a baba and so um, so I know that from the the language in and of itself is you know something that um, you know connotes a, a high degree of respect right and so but whether I mean and if you think about it I mean one of the challenges that we also face here is the fact that we don't control the media. And so, as a consequence, our images are controlled by people other than us. Correct. In Africa, in Africa, they do control the media, 
And so the images that would be perpetuated there would be similar to how I would hope anyway, they would be similar to the way that people actually see things as opposed to the way that people want to spin things. Correct. And, uh, but I do want to, to apply and get a Fulbright and actually be able to study that in more detail to see how are the perceptions and stereotypes of men in African American or men of African ancestry in the Caribbean and Africa. I'll be interested. When you get that going or either done, I'm definitely going to be interested in that as well. Because, again, like you just said, in terms of the portrayal, the portrayal Mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, the media who owns the media can now portray what they want us to see versus what reality is. I I know a couple of years ago I had um, the young lady who plays Thelma on Good Times. She was one of my guests. And... Mm -hmm. We were talking, and it was like she was telling me how, like, the strength of Esther Roll, who played the mother mm-hmm. on Good Times. She, originally, whenever they put Good Times together, they wanted to write that as Florida being a single mother. Mm-hmm. She, she wanted that, that was the original when the script writers and the producers and the exec producers got together. Their intent in mind was for that show to be just Florida and the kids. And Esther Roll stood up and said, No, I will not do that role. We will not do this show with me in it unless there's a father in the Mm -hmm. picture all right and Mm -hmm. so that's where kind of like uh the james evans role came from because she said there are families that black families who do have fathers so back to your point of what media wants to show us versus what really is could be two different things Mm -hmm. oh yeah oh yeah no question i mean so there's um i'm not sure if it's been with with a book called white rage Written by a sister named Carol Anderson. Yeah, I have it as well. That right, yes. And and so her, you know, which which she really documents is the fact that every time that we make advancements, and so you think about the hundreds of years that it took our ancestors to get out of slavery. And then we come out of slavery, we go to a hundred years of Jim Crow. And that every and all the laws, all the norms in the society for hundreds of years was intended for us to stay in slavery. And sometimes people will overlook the fact that had the Confederacy won the war, slavery would have continued to have been expanded. Correct. And so, so what Kyle Anderson does in the book is to document that after slavery is over and we finally get, you know, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment to pass and black men get the right to vote, that even during Reconstruction when we're voting, all the different things that were being done to kill us, to, you know, Ku Klux Klan is created, all those things are done in order to... to prevent us from being able to advance. And so when we look at all the different challenges and the barriers we put in front of us, then absolutely, yes, you know, we have had to, our, our hurdles that we've had to come over a bit higher than any other group in the country. And I, you know, and I, when I'm teaching my classes at Rutgers, if there's Asian students, Latin students in the class, all, of, all the other groups that came to the country got the benefit of our work. And so absolutely. Who's, who's an integrated because of the people that fought in the civil rights movement. The, the true people, and I mean, Alexis Hughes' poem said it best, you know, let America be what it's never been for me. And so the true patriots of the country have been the people at the front line. I mean, the Ruby Bridges bomb just passed. And so right. when you look at the people who are at the front line of being able to make America live up to its creed or the ideals, it was, it's people of African ancestry who are overcoming all of these hoses and dogs and all the different kind of stuff, the times, all the stuff. John Lewis just passed. I mean, when you think about the people who invested their work, correct, the sacrifice in order for us to be where we are, and so that's what I would say to my children. So we'd be driving, and they say, you know, they tired, they hungry. But so Harry Tubman was running under the sun of death to get out of slavery. Right, so, damn it, just be quiet. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> But it's true. I mean, but see, again, at least you were giving the kids that perspective. And that's what I believe is missing. And, and again, there is no question now that we have reconnected. And I honestly wish we were back in the building. And when we do get back in there, we will at some point. But even if we have to do it virtually, I got to have you up in front of my uh, boys and with their some of their fathers. Because now what came to mind as I was talking to you is I got to get the fathers of the boys together and have a session with them. And now talking to you, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to reach out to you to do that session with them. These kind of conversations. Cause like I said, when I, that's what I meant when I was talking about before we went on air in terms of me being able to do what I want to do, cause it's such a small group. 
Um, I mean, we we went into house models in terms of like we were broken into houses and they got a chance to name their own house. So we had the X house, the Ali house, the Louis Latimer house, the Cesar Chavez house. We had six houses in all. There's two more. The Nelson Mandela house. And there was one more. But I mean, and then in the mornings when we were talking about that structure and routine. I would come in and call off the house name and they all had, they picked a quote from each the person that they chose. And when I would mm-hmm. walk through and say, X house, X house mm-hmm. would yell back at me by any means necessary. And what you call, <laughs> when, when we got the Ali house, we are the greatest. What you call, I mean, when I start telling you like we getting into our ethnicity and our African heritage and the connection with our ancestors, I really got a chance to push that bar here. And so, and, and it helps with the self esteem. It helps with the whole understanding of you come from greatness. I don't care what society right. tells you. I don't care what the media tells you. You come right. from greatness. And I get a chance mm-hmm. to do that there. That's right. That's right, bro. That's what's needed. It is. That's absolutely what's needed. Absolutely what's needed. It, yep. it, it, other groups, that's exactly what they do. I, I love my Jewish brothers and sisters because they're very clear on never again. They're very mm-hmm. clear on connecting the kids to their heritage. And right. uh, Martin Luther King said this back in the day that we need to take on those same concepts. And so Absolutely. that's where, like, when I'm hearing you talk about the conversations you have with your kids, that's why, you know, they, they, they've moved the way that they've moved. And the fact that you've done it against the stereotypical odds is what makes this thing so powerful for me. Well, bro, I'm just like I say, man, um, one of my friends, I used to tell him, you know, we would talk and I'd say, bro, um, my, my biggest prayer, when I say my prayers every day is I stay healthy because what I didn't want to happen was that something happened to me and then right. the children had to get split up or go to foster care. Right. And you know, we're overrepresented in foster care or then these children would go with this family and these children would go with this I was like, you know, because when I first became a single dad, you know, the mom asked, could the daughters go with her? No, 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 no. We all got to stay together. I don't right. Know, some of them all over, all over, we all need to be together. And so, man, so I am just profoundly grateful, brother, that the creator kept all of us healthy and well to, um, to reach the point where we are now. And so um, it's been a profound blessing. And so, yeah, I was really, in, I was very intentional. About, exactly. Uh, you know what? What I wanted them to hear, the the path that I wanted them to follow, and the fact that you know I was consistent with my expectations, about, right? And, and reinforcement, like, all right, listen, you know. And so I remember one time when I, when my son was, um, you know, I had to take him to my Saturday program. So one of his friends was like, "Well, he already on I don't know why he's here." <laughs> 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 I said, well, he did some out of order stuff, bro. So you know, if you, if you be, even if you're smart, if you're out of order, you still got to a toe. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. We are down to the part in the interview that I shared with you earlier. This is your opportunity to promote. You can promote book sign where the book is available, where it's going to be available, uh, any sessions. I mean, you can promote, like I shared with you earlier, the only thing you cannot say is a price or a dollar amount. But anything short of that, uh, the mic is yours to promote and let folks know uh, how they can get a copy of Baba and the crew, how they can get in touch with you, your website, so forth and so on. So I'm going to turn my mic button off and it's yours for the next few minutes to promote. Well, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate the conversation and the opportunity. And um, I hope that people who are listening will go to my website, www.babaslegacy.com, babaslegacy.com. There's information there about the book. We've had some um, some launch celebrations, and so there are videos of the launch celebrations that have taken place. Um, there's email address, there's a phone number, and the book is available for sale. The only bookstore that's available for sale right now is Source of Knowledge Bookstore, which is on Broad Street, downtown North. Um, in addition to the book, I also do events. So there's some Kwanzaa events that will happen starting the middle of December, um, in which I will be signing books at some of those events. There'll be, we're going to do socially distanced 
all those kind of things to make sure that people stay safe. I'm still going to, in fact, I'm going to follow back up with the source of knowledge to see if we can do a book signing there. Um, but I really do hope that people will go to the website, Baba's Legacy, www.babaslegacy.com, B-A-B-A-S-L-E-G-A-C-Y.com. I look forward to any comments or suggestions. Um, I know a couple of people, you know, said they were going to be on the call today, so I hope that they were listening in and that they will send a note, you know, their thoughts and reactions. And then once you read the book, um, so Mark has extended an invitation for me to come and talk to the young men in his school. I'm interested in talking to young men and to young women, for that matter, because the issues that impact the black family are profound. And so I think that Correct. having a community conversation about how do we start to look at our family and what can we do to make sure that our families are healthy is one that I absolutely desire to participate in. All right. Source of knowledge. I, I met him over the, okay, let me say, yeah, I, I, over the summer. I was going to say, yeah, we're in the fall now. I met him over the summer. I've been to the store a few times. Matter of fact, I bought a, a few African masks from there, a couple, a few books from there. Uh, so good. If it's down there, that's that's a good place to be. I'm trying to think of it because I, I know his name and it's just not coming to me at the moment. I see his face. Yeah, in fact, I mean, in fact in there, the bookstore was up for an award. Yes. Um, because the brother wanted to get a bus so they could actually um, drive to different locations with books. Right. And so, um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I have to check the next time I talk to him whether they actually – Received it, what it was like ten thousand or twenty thousand dollars, and so you know they were asking people to vote. So right, I'm trying. I know, um, I know him well because we became quick friends once we met because we had a mutual friend that we both didn't know the other knew. And um, so then I had started patronizing the store, and I've been down there, and I go in there, I like lose my mind. Anytime I go in a bookstore, I lose my mind. But then when it's a combination of an African American bookstore and owned by, <laughs> I really lose my right. mind. <laughs> That's right. Right. So they right. have the yeah. African artifacts in there. They have African oh, yeah. paintings in there. So I'm glad to hear it's yeah. there because now I know where to send folks to if they don't want to order online. I know where the folks to send 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 them to. Uh, and then at some point, you, um, I can't imagine you not winding up at some point being in Barnes and Noble or one of the bookstores. So yeah, I wish. Like there's, there's, go ahead. There's many steps you have to go through. Uh, yes. So yes. I, yes. Amazon, but in order to get it into other bookstores, you have to go through another. Um, process which got finished about two weeks ago so okay. it can be ordered by Barnes and Noble and other bookstores no yeah, Barnes and Noble is their strength it's like for me as a musician and a podcaster out of all the different sites Pandora was the most strenuous so I kind of consider mm-hmm. Barnes and Noble kind of like the Pandora of because out of all the authors I talked to that, that exactly what you just described is what they describe and the brother's name just came to me Dexter Dexter, That's his right. name, Dexter. Dexter down at uh, Source of Knowledge Bookstore. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Bill, man, it's been great. To, I am definitely going to circle back with you again because, again, you you line right up with what my mission is over at the Young Men's Leadership Academy. That's the name of my school, Young Men's Leadership Academy. So, your 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 what you do lines right up with what I'm doing there dovetails with it nice so i'm definitely gonna reach back out to you uh, and who knows i might see if we can get a copy of baba and all my father's hands there <laughs> oh yeah that'd, that'd be great yeah so let's see if we can we can we can do something i'll be happy to sign books for the brothers so you know all right uh, yeah yeah we can definitely do that so i I rec- for those who did not rise early, I do record the show. That's why I said earlier I wanted to make sure the recorder was working, and I post them up on my YouTube site. The archives of the shows are there, and then I will also, if I have your email or get your email, I'll email you the MP3 link and the YouTube channel, and then you can do what you want with it. Okay. All right. Sounds good to me. Yes, sir. All right. We will get back together. Tiffany, if you're listening, good morning. Lestine Robinson, I saw your text from me. You're listening. Good morning. Anybody from class of 80 who might have tuned in, good morning to you. Anybody from the Patterson Music Makers who tuned in, good morning to you. Good morning to everybody. Had a wonderful time, as expected, talking to Bill Davis Jr. And the book is Baba, B-A-B-A, and the crew. A True Story of a Single Black Father's Journey to Redemption. Make sure you get your copy. It is worth it. All right, Bill. With that said, man, have a wonderfully blessed day and week, weekend and week and rest of the lifetime. <laughs> I appreciate it, Mark. Thank you and anybody that's listening. 
Thank you. Enjoy the sunshine today. It's really beautiful outside. A little chilly, but beautiful. All right now. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Have, Thank you, sir. All right. Take care.